And this is Ariana from Well Fed Photography, and I'm so delighted to be joined by Rona Fitzpatrick of The Diamond Expert so that she can tell us a bit more about what she does as an industry expert when it comes to jewelry and all things diamonds. And uh, we are also going to chat about her being featured in our upcoming book of breastfeeding stories. She's featured with her daughter, Maya. And while we won't go into her full story, as we'd like to save that for the book, I would love to hear what it has been like for her to be able to share her story and also to see the photographs of her and her daughter. Um, having that bond and having those experiences. And yes, yeah, so there's so much good information ahead. I hope you'll enjoy this episode. And Rona, would you do a bit to just introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks so much, Ariana, for having me on. Um, so my name is Rona Fitzpatrick, and I set up the Diamond Expert um, in January of last year. <laughs> so the worst possible time to set up a business. Um, but my background is that I actually work in the um, horse racing and bloodstock industry for the first part of my career. I studied science at university. I was horse mad. I fell into the racing industry and I worked in that industry uh, for 10 amazing years, um, even going to America, to Kentucky to work for a year for Tony Ryan. And it's when I came back from there. I was in London, just sort of deciding what I wanted to do with my career. And I met the owner of Boodles Jewelers, which is one of the big luxury Bond Street jewelers. Um, we hit it off. And, um, you know, before I knew it, I was I was offered a job working for them back here in Dublin because I'd been in the UK for 14 years. So I came back to Dublin into the jewelry industry, not having an, an, a clue about it, a very steep learning curve and um, had a, a fabulous career uh, with them for 10 years, which I, I loved every minute of it. Um, then I left there to have my, my daughter, Maya. Um, I very much knew that I, I always wanted to spend those early years with her at home. I didn't want to work. I wanted to focus on, on being a mother. And it was a struggle for us to, to conceive Maya. So it was, it was extra special to be able to be at home with her. And I was so lucky that I was able to do that. So grateful for that. And then it sort of felt natural then at the beginning of last year to um, to go back into some sort of working career, um, but yet still be at home. Um, and I was very lucky that I've always had a, an amazing relationship, a direct relationship with a workshop um, that I really highly, highly respect and, and trust. So and they've, they used to approach me every year to try and get me to work with them, but I was still working for Boodles at the time. So um it sort of happened very naturally, organically, that I decided to, to work with them. And I set up my jewellery um, business, which I call the Diamond Experts. And um, it's an online business, as so many of them are now. And I help people um, create bespoke pieces of jewellery um, through a service where I guide them in terms of the design and um, what gemstones to choose and what styles are going to suit them. And engagement rings is really, really popular. Um, so yeah, it's it's the most amazing job, and I, I just absolutely love every minute of it. What is it like for you to be a part of so many people's special memories, like an engagement ring? I mean, they're going to have that for their life. So they're going to have it for life, like? but I get to be a part of that experience. I get to be a part of their their memory. I mean, everybody remembers where they got their engagement ring from, right? Um, and they'll always remember the person they bought it from. I mean, even remember when I was working in Boodles. I mean, I just get goosebumps every time that couple walks in and, you know, the, the sort of nervous excitement on their face and they're sitting down and you're showing them all these, you know, dazzling rings. And then, you know, eventually you settle on, on one ring and it's just the most wonderful experience. And, you know, you're, you're dealing with people at their happiest times in their life. So it's just, it's, it's, I think that along with delivering babies must be the best job in the world. <laughs> and do you, so mine is less stressful. <laughs> when, when I'm working with clients and I'm photographing them, there are times when I'm processing their photographs that I know, like those photographs are the ones, those are photographs that they are going to want to keep with them to look back on for life. And I'll know that before I even have a photo reveal with them. Do you have that connection to, when you're working with people and jewelry? Like, you know, you mentioned having all these dazzling pieces set out in front of them. But can you tell when someone really connects with a piece of jewelry? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely, you can. You can see it in their face, in their eyes, their body language, the, the tone of their voice. They'll go quiet and, um, oh, for sure, absolutely. Or when someone contacts me about a piece that I may have featured on my Instagram account and, you know, although you're just reading words on a, on a message, you can you can feel that emotion come through and you can you sense it for them. And, you know, there's there's also like a, you know, there's a there's a magic behind these pieces of jewellery that some people are drawn to certain things. And, you know, uh, you know, a bit like you with the Ashoka, it's just, you know, it's clearly meant to be for you. And I love that. I love those moments. And um, I also love when men plan jewellery for their wives um, without the wife knowing, because I think it's the most romantic and special and exciting moment. And that man is trusting me completely to help them create this piece of jewellery, which their wife is going to be blown away by. Um, I had an instant with a, with a gentleman in Dubai recently, and recently, last summer, and he created this, uh, this piece of jewellery for his wife for their um, wedding anniversary. Oh no, sorry, it wasn't wedding anniversary, it was her birthday, a big birthday. And um, we did it all, you know, behind the scenes and, and, you know, he was on the phone to me every day and we were creating this, this piece. And then he took a, a, he had someone take a video of her when he unveiled the piece of jewellery for her, for her birthday. And it was just magic. It's just the emotion on, on her face and the excitement. And, yeah, is this the one is. where she opens it and then like falls back in the chair? Yes. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched that video just because I can feel her reaction. I can feel her excitement. Yeah, and it's you can. Like, you totally can. And, I, you know, I put music over it because I didn't want to be too intrusive. Obviously, I had their permission to share it. But yeah, I mean, you, you can and you can. You know, if you were to hear what was said behind and, and the people and, and just the emotion, it was it was incredible. Well, I know wow. that you hinted at it a little bit with the Ashoka, but we are currently working on having a ring made for myself, my, my husband and I, and my husband's been working with, uh, with Rona to bring this to fruition. And he said nothing but the kindest, most positive things about working with you to, oh. to, to have this happen. How nice you've been along the way, um, your expert guidance. We both have appreciated it so much. And I find it so different to, you know, going to a high street shop I'm sure you can still have fantastic experience, but it's a little different. You know, you might be put on a wait list. You might have someone who really just wants to speak about themselves and what they've learned in the industry, but they're not really connecting with you personally. Whereas with you, our experience has been that of the highest service, you know, like you really care about understanding the little details that are important to us, why it's important to us, and just ensuring that we have that beautiful finished product that we've been dreaming about. So thank you. And I just, I just had to add that in because it's so different than what I've experienced in going into a shop. So I know you mentioned people purchasing online. What, what, you know, there seems to be a shift towards this. Like people are trusting to purchase pieces of jewelry online a little bit more. Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the online jewelry industry is set to reach 480 billion by 2025, which is obviously huge. And it's growing exponentially year on year. And obviously we've had an unprecedented year in the last 12 months and people are, are doing you know, online shopping for things that they wouldn't have bought before. And jewelry is one of those things. I mean, online jewelry has been, has been a growing for the last maybe sort of 10, 20 years. Um, but people have got much more trust in, um, in the brands that they know and brands that they feel that they can trust. Um, I, I think I read a statistic uh, today that 51% of millennials buy their own jewelry, but the same percentage of millennials will only buy from a brand that they can trust, that they feel that they can trust. So. For me, with my online presence, it's all about the, um, the customer or the person just viewing my account for the first time, getting to know me, Rona, getting to know how I work, what I provide, how I do it, my expertise and my background. Um, and yes, I, it's, you know, for me, it's even nicer than working in a retail space because it's more private. I'm dealing with that person one-on-one. -on -one. I have as much time in the world for that person. There's no distractions. Um, that person has complete privacy and complete trust in, in me when they're talking to me about their creation. Um, and you can get to know them much better, I think, than in, than in a retail environment. Um, but trust is a huge thing. And that's why I try to have as much presence online as possible so people can get to know me and get to trust me. And then on the flip side of that, the, the workshop I, I deal with and the people I get to create um, my jewellery 
there's a, a huge element of trust there. So I've known them for 14 years. I know the quality of their stuff is phenomenal. It's beyond anything that I've ever seen in, in my career. Um, and their prices are amazing. And I love the fact that I can control all of these elements and bring you, the, the customer, the best quality piece of jewellery and the most amazing price. So well, that's I, love that. I love that too, because you're not on the high street, therefore you're not paying the rents, the overheads are different. So you can give yes. people maybe what we would call a fairer price because they aren't yes. having to consider that aspect of the purchase. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And I just love that it's such um, it's such a bespoke and personalized service. And, you know, the best part of my job is is the people, is getting to know the people and sharing in those magical moments. Um, I had a, an experience with this lady that she contacted me through my Instagram, Instagram account and we had a phone call. And I always say to people, you know, let's chat on the phone and you can tell so much from someone by just speaking to them. And instantly we had a rapport. And she was just the most fabulous woman. And she was buying this piece of jewellery for herself because she felt like she deserved it. She'd had a rough, a rough year, a rough couple of years before. And she felt like she deserved it, which I just loved that. So she wanted a, a diamond uh, line bracelet or a tennis bracelet. And she had a very clear idea of what she wanted. But she didn't realise that she was going to be able to get so much more for her money with me than she had previously thought. Um, so we created the piece of jewellery. And it was sent over. And obviously, because of lockdown, I couldn't deliver it personally. So she trusted me to, to send it to her. We sent it securely to her. And she said, Rona, this means so much to me that I have set up a whole little ceremony that I'm going to do when I receive the piece of jewellery. So she received the package. She went and she got herself a takeaway coffee. And she went to this lake with this like ruin, like a, like a, a ruin, castle ruin and sat by the lake. It was her favorite spot in the world, she told me. She was also a photographer, by the way. And she sat there on her own with her magnificent piece of jewelry, opened it all by herself and just relished in that moment. And it just, it blew me away, the emotion of it, because it meant so much to her. And it was such a, an incredibly special private moment that she created this, this scene. It was, it was magical. Well, and I love that, you know, whether it's family photography or a beautiful piece of jewelry, the, those pieces are symbols of being able to love yourself and feel worthy of that. And so I love that she created that ceremony to really celebrate it because it wasn't just the piece of jewelry, it was everything around it. It was, you know, loving herself enough to take the leap to make the investment, you know, Absolutely. and feeling worthy of wearing that beautiful piece yeah. of jewelry or having it. And yeah. So I think sometimes the things that we do and working through our gifts and our talents is really just a representation of, or an extension of someone's self-love and how they're loving themselves, you know? Absolutely. And I think as women, we don't do that enough. And I think, I hope, I'd love to see this year being even more about women, you know, feeling worthy of treating themselves to something like a piece of jewelry or their husband or partner or sister or brother or parents surprising someone with a piece of jewellery that just makes them feel so special I mean let's face it diamonds make everyone feel special <laughs> <laughs> they, you, can, you can be in your pajamas on the sofa and you look down at your diamond ring and you're just like wow um, they, they but do. yeah I think um I think it was just so special it symbolized so much for that lady and I think a piece of jewellery no matter what the circumstances will always have symbolization behind it and it's just the the emotion and the you know the, the the special feeling behind that which I just which I just love. I love that, and it will forever be able to serve as that anchor for her. You know that she is special and she is worthy. Every time that she looks at it, it will offer that to her. So I love for sure. that. And also, she has she has two children, and one of her one of her children is a daughter. And like you with your daughter, me with my daughter, these pieces it's 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 a part of your legacy. It's and um, you know it's something that. The story lives on forever and it's something that we can hand down to our children and they will have forever and it's the same with your amazing uh, photographs it is it's 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 a it's yours is a moment captured in time those memories which let's face it that's all we have at the end of the day is, is memories and to have them immortalized on on your wall is is just incredible i so agree and that's why i 
for me, like I don't really buy um, costume jewelry or just, you know, the, the regular old type of jewelry, not because there's anything wrong with it. But for me, I just I love quality pieces that I know will leave that legacy, you know, that I can pass down to my daughter yeah. and that, um, you know, I'll be completely open and honest. Like I would love her to have the capacity to if she wanted to start a business to be able to um, have investments to be able to do that. And so for me. A beautiful piece of jewelry can either carry the sentiment of her wearing it or it could carry the sentiment of my mom cared enough to think to invest in things for me so that um the pot the, the things that i wanted to bring to creation i can now do through that so i yeah. think that there's such a double meaning for me in that piece of jewelry and of course the connection with my husband and i and what that means so you know that's just the one piece and who knows what else <laughs> we'll go on to explore and to, to purchase with you but it's been so wonderful and one thing that i love that you touched on before was the bespoke nature of it and the fact that it's different than walking into a shop where you know the pieces are ready made and you just purchase what's there you yeah. know to be able to have you send the diamond to us and say you know this is the diamond is are you okay for us to move forward with this piece this diamond for your jewelry it's yeah there's the video you know, is that what you mean the, yes. the video i sent yeah <laughs> it's it just feels like you have such a such an influence such a hand in the creation of the piece that you will get to have whereas you know if you just walk in and buy something like that's already pre-made. Those are beautiful and wonderful, but yeah. I love the bespoke nature. So I'd love to hear actually about some of the favorite pieces that you've helped to create over the years. Okay. Um, well, the the diamond uh, line bracelet that I mentioned for that lady, that that was very special because I think because of what I, I, I know, I knew what it meant to her and what it symbolized for her. That was incredibly, incredibly special. Um, then I also did um, a full hoop paternity ring for a lady uh, recently, which was, is, again, a very dear friend of mine. Um, and it again, it just it symbolized so much for me in terms of the, the, the relationship that we had together, her and I actually. But also for her, it was, um, you know, to symbolize her and her success as, as a woman and um, a piece of jewelry that she was going to wear every single day. Um, and it was it was a piece from her husband to her, but um, it meant so much to me, I think, because of the relationship that I had with this woman. And she trusted me to create this for her from scratch. She trusted me if, through the whole process from beginning to end. And when I unveiled it to her, because she lives quite locally, so I was able to deliver it to her masked up you know outdoors at night it was uh, it was lovely it was magical she was there with her daughter and you know just the reaction when she saw it um was just it just makes it that's my that makes my job so so worthwhile and so incredible um but over the years i mean i've been very lucky to have created some incredible pieces for um uh, one particular lady um i i was the first the only person to sell a blue diamond in ireland the only, the only blue diamond to be sold in Ireland and it's it features on my Instagram account it's a marquise shape which is like a boat shape um in a, a sort of elaborate uh, diamond pave setting um which was very special a really beautiful beautiful piece and to be able to to create pieces of jewelry like that that are so unique is is really exciting but to be honest with you everything is exciting for me because it's exciting for that customer and I just feed off that. I, it can be a wedding band. I mean, my jewellery, I, I sell jewellery from anything from 200 euro up to 200,000 euro. So, um, you know, even a wedding band for a lady who has maybe got her engagement ring somewhere else and didn't know that I, that I existed has come to me for a wedding band, a diamond set wedding band to go with her engagement ring. And the excitement that she feels when... She ties it on with her engagement ring and she knows what it's going to look like on her wedding day. She puts the two together for the first time and it's just like, wow. And I just can't help be drawn in by the, the emotion and the excitement. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. And I know that you can actually help recreate or reimagine pieces of jewelry. Like maybe if someone has inherited a piece and they yes. want to modernize it or they want to change it around to make it their own. Can you speak to us about that? Yes. This I love, I love, love, love doing. And I know it's something you do with your photographs, by the way. So there's so much uh, similarities between what we do. And um, so 
I've done this a number of times for people, both friends, family and, and customers, um, whereby they may have inherited a piece. Um, most commonly, it's a ring um, and it may have, you know, a center stone could be a colored stone like there was one I did, which was a beautiful aquamarine. And it was just in a really old fashioned yellow gold setting. It did nothing for the stone. And we just whipped out the, uh, the aquamarine and we put it into a beautiful um, platinum and white diamond pave setting with split shoulders because it was quite a big stone. So the split shoulders looked great and it completely transformed it. Absolutely transformed it. It's like a completely different piece of jewellery. Um, so it's a wonderful thing to do. And you still maintain the sentiment of the piece that that person has given you. So another lady had a two diamond, you know, the, those um, quite old fashioned settings where there's two diamonds and they're twisted. And it's quite common, you know, when our parents were growing up and um, we reset it with a beautiful tanzite in the middle. And so she still has the emotion and the sentiment attached to those two white diamonds but now they're just, you know, coupled with a with a stunning uh, tanzanite, and it's it's a whole new piece of jewelry. So it's I love love doing remodels. I just think it's um, it, it's just incredible. And as you know, like what you do, where you have an old photograph, maybe it's not great quality or it's a little bit damaged, and to be able to rejuvenate that and give it a new lease of life, it's just it's just amazing. Yes, I'm, I am always blown away, like when we get to chatting about how there are so many similarities in what we do, even though they seem yeah. so completely different, you know, photographs and jewelry, but really there are so many similarities. Um, so many. And I, I suppose if people want to, you know, get started with a piece of jewelry, or maybe they're interested in purchasing, but they don't know where to start, how do they begin this process with you? So generally people will contact me um, and they'll just ask, you know, for example, if it's a piece of jewelry they want to re recreate, uh, sorry, uh, uh, remodel like we were talking about, or it's a, a piece of jewelry that they're looking for, like an engagement ring or a necklace or earrings, whatever it might be. And generally I, we chat on, on Instagram or Facebook or WhatsApp a little bit, but I always encourage people to have a phone call with me because then I can get a real sense of, of what they're looking for. And they can ask all the questions that are, you know, they're burning to ask. Um, and then generally what we do is I go away and get them a quote. Um, so I'll, I'll have an understanding of exactly what they're looking for um, or as close to exactly what they're looking for. And then I'll get them a quote. And if they're happy with the quote, then we go ahead and make up the piece of jewellery. And then generally I'm able to provide a video, a 3D video of the piece before it's even sent from the workshop. Um, and they see it, and if there's any changes they need to make, we, we can do it then, but generally we, we get it right first time. Um, and then the piece of jewellery is sent over, and then I hopefully deliver it personally, which is what I love to do, and I know you probably are missing that element of it as well. We're not able to meet people so much at the moment, um, but yes, so then um, I deliver the piece of jewellery and I present it to them. And for, for, for me, there's no deposit required for creating pieces of jewellery. The client only pays when they see the piece and they're 100% happy with it. So that's another thing to do with the, the trust element of, of buying. You know, it's not as if you're having to put money into something that you don't know about. You, you literally have nothing to lose. You, you don't pay for it until you see it, um, which is great. That is the most amazing facet of what you do as well I mean beyond everything else just the fact that that's your guarantee to people that you want to make yeah. sure that they're happy and they're satisfied before they yeah. make the, the final purchase and complete the purchase yeah and um, I know that you can also assist people with having their pieces valued as well is that right yes absolutely valued and repairs as well we can we can help with so uh, yeah having having the piece valued is so important um because, you know, depending on, on what it is, but, you know, um, it's, it's so important to protect that piece. And, you know, if it would ever go missing or be stolen, that you, you know, you have the um, resources to replace it. Yes. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We're still going to merge um, your business with motherhood before we move on to, the, you know, having you in the book of breastfeeding stories and what's the, what that's meant. But I'd love to hear what it has meant for you to be able to go out on your own and start a business and have Maya see her mom do this. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny you say see her mom do it because she literally sees, you know, she sees me, you know, 
videoing and photographing the jewellery, you know, looking at them, inspecting them when they come in. And she sees everything. And I tell her, I tell her, you know, mommy's, I've got, mommy's got to go and call a, a lady about a, a diamond ring now. <laughs> and she'll say, yippee. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and you know, I mean, first and foremost, um, I mean, I'm the most important job in the world for me is, is being a mother. And I'm so grateful to be able to create this business that I can do alongside of, with, of being a mother. Um, and I think it's so important for our children to see us as independent women and women that have a career and, and a goal in life and um, a purpose. And I explained to her, you know, what it is that I do and, and when I'm working. So um, hopefully this is some sort of legacy that I can, hold, you know, hand down to Maya uh, in the future. I mean, maybe, maybe not. It would be her choice. Um, but yes, I think uh, as role models, I think it's incredibly important to know that we have plenty of, you know, mummy and Maya time. But also, you know, I have my I have my work time as well. And, you know, my other half works from home as well and we're able to to juggle things in that way which is which is great um, and what does it mean for you as a mother to also have something like to be able to pour into Maya but to also have something for yourself yeah it, it's amazing like as I was saying earlier I I really wanted to spend those first formative years with Maya you know full time and then you feel like it's ready you're ready then to step in in back into you know being being your own person and you do, I, I, I did miss the, uh, the independence and I'd missed working and I missed the interaction with people. So for me, it's, it just felt exactly like the right time. And I get such, um, such fulfillment from what I do. And I think it's really important that our little girls see that, you know, I think it's really important they see mom as, as the working mom, as well as, as just full-time mom. So yeah, yeah. yeah I've loved that. And I feel like we're in such a privileged position where, you know, there are a lot of moms who leave to go to work. They leave the house to go to work and they're not seen. And while I do have aspects of my job that you know, I'm away from the home, too, I think it's great for my children to see that I'm working. It's great for them to understand, to be able to put a visual together of what that looks like versus, you know, when someone's working elsewhere, they, they don't really have that, you know, they, they don't have yeah. that vision of what's actually happening. They just know they're gone to work, but they don't have to yeah 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 absolutely and you know I, I don't know about you growing up but you know my mother didn't work when I when I grew up and I think there's a very fine balance between as you say you know we're so lucky that we didn't have to you know leave our children when they were very young and, and go commuting to a job nine to five um so that's a huge a huge bonus but also for them to be able to see that we we do work we have our own time I always remember listening to um it was a podcast I think by Janet Lansbury when Maya was very very young and she talked about the importance of your child understanding that you mommy need time on on your own and that it's really important for them to to grow up with that respect of you know you having your own time and your own space aside from being you know the best mother in the world that you can be to your child um, so I've never felt any um I've never felt any sort of emotional tugging in that regard. I've always been able to explain to, to Maya that, you know, I've got to work and it, you know, I'm able to do it in between the day. So it doesn't have huge impact in her. I do it mostly on the morning uh, when she's at Montessori, but, um, but she also understands that there are times where, you know, I need to go and do my thing. Yeah, I think it's brilliant for them to be able to see that because they're able to form a respect for your time as well. I think whenever yes. you have something that is, outside of them or you know it's not all about them whenever you have something that is just for you even if it's self-care time you know yeah. for mothers who are home with their children even to have a, you know an agreement with a partner or with a friend that you take a certain amount of self-care time each day or each yeah. week it's great for your children to see that because it gives them the invitation to have that for themselves as well absolutely and it gives them the invitation to 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 respect themselves and and be okay with that yeah for sure well, let's talk about the book of breastfeeding stories. Um, for, for people who don't know that are listening, uh, at the end of 2019, I just kind of received this intuitive message that I was meant to start this book of breastfeeding stories and really um, pour into helping to shift culture when it comes to breastfeeding and how it's viewed in Ireland 
And I knew that the best way I could do this was by gathering stories from people who actually were breastfeeding or chest feeding or exclusively pumping. And so Rona ended up being one of the individuals who got in touch. So Rona, I'd love to hear how you found out about the project and what about it spoke to you? What made you reach out? Okay. So um, it was uh, through a friend of mine, one of my best, best friends, um, who told me, I think she sent me on the link. So she, I'm not sure how she'd found it, but she sent me on the link and said, oh, you, this is something you might be interested in. And it was a link about, you know, you and why you were doing this book and that you were looking for people with interesting stories behind breastfeeding. And I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd love to share my story. So I, um, and the reason when you say what spoke to me and what made me reach out, it was because I felt that if I could help even one person who was in the same situation as me with my story, then that was, that was it. That was my, my, I would make me feel so much better. It was job done. Um, so I reached out to you and, and my story was that uh, we conceived Maya through IVF and I was an older mother getting pregnant and all along the way, I was told um, that I wouldn't be able to produce enough milk and that I, that I wouldn't be able to breastfeed. And I remember just being so confused by this. I couldn't understand how something that had happened in a laboratory could affect the, the physical body of, between me and my child when she was born. Um, and when she was born, um, there was plenty of uh plenty of advice against even trying to breastfeed and wouldn't the easiest option just be to to give a formula but um having having wanted for nine months a natural birth and that was sadly not an option for me at the end I was um it was the only thing that I was left to take control of so I was determined and I am a bit like a dog with a bone I'm a Leo so there's there's no stopping me if I put my mind to something um and but interestingly, I'd done very little pre preparation for breastfeeding. All my preparation was for my gentle, unmedicated birth, which I never got to have. So I um, was determined to make this work. And we're very lucky that it did come relatively easy to us. Um, she latched on immediately and, and fed like a dream. Um, but then I was in hospital for three days and, you know, I was being told that my body wasn't producing enough milk. And I was confused by this because she was happy, she was sleeping, she wasn't crying, um, she was having dirty nappies. Um, so I was very confused by this. And you know, the birth is so med birth and, and breastfeeding is, is is so sorry, birth is so medicalized now that breastfeeding doesn't really seem to play as big a role as it should uh, for new mothers. So I um I, we persevered and I remember they sent us home and they said they sent us home with these little bottles of pre-made up formula and you know just in case and then we went they said you know you need to go to the supermarket and, and get more of them and I remember we were standing in the aisle in Tesco's and Maya was on my chest in a stretchy wrap and Ken was with me and I was just looking at this shelf they weren't even refrigerated I was looking at this shelf and I of, of baby formula and I just said no, I, I just, I can't do it. I'm sorry, it just doesn't feel right. And I'm sure you can agree when you're a mother, if something doesn't feel right, it's generally not right for you. And if something feels right, then it's generally right. <laughs> yes. So that's, uh, that was my story. And that's how I came to, to, to meet you. And you mentioned in the interview that you had received so much help from others. You had actually had a community around you of people who were so supportive of your breastfeeding. Yeah. Maybe not, you know, at the very start with the with the medical community, but in, in the community at large, you were able to get support. So where where did you how did you form a community? Where did you find these people? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I was so lucky. I mean, Facebook gets such a bad rap, doesn't it? But you know, Facebook is where it began. Facebook um Breast, I had been a, a member of this gentle birth um, Facebook group. And then through that, people suggest, you know, all the different groups. And I became a member of breast, um, Extended Breastfeeding Ireland, which extended breastfeeding is, is anything past, I can't remember, is it something like six weeks, crazy, something like that. Um, and then you get put in touch with all different communities and organizations such as Quid You and Lilesh League, which are, Quidju is actually a, a, an organization that supports women 
whether you're breastfeeding or not, it doesn't, you can be first baby, 10th baby, <laughs> whichever. Um, so very quickly got um, so much support. And, you know, even there are even breastfeeding buddies for you when you, uh, so she was born in 2017 and um, you can even go out into the public and breastfeed it for, for the first time if you're nervous with another lady who's done it and, you know, can help support you. Um, so we had uh, breastfeeding counsellors come up to the house just to check that I was doing everything right. And um, Maya was a very petite baby. And, you know, they talk about the percentiles of growth. And, you know, she was always on the lower end, not right down the bottom, but she was always on the lower end. But they make you, they, they I'm sure they don't do this intentionally, but they make you feel a little bit un, uh, insecure about the growth of your baby. Um so I got uh, this lady to come to the house a couple of times just to check with check in on me. And she's like, Rona, you're doing an amazing job. Um, your baby is growing. She's she's uh, growing exactly how she should be growing. She's got wet and dirty nappies. She's sleeping really well. She's feeding really well. It's all good. And it's just those words for someone to be able to reassure you and, and let you know that, you, you know, you're doing you're doing everything right, despite all of the information that might let you think otherwise. And what has it meant to you to have been able to breastfeed Maya, considering you didn't get the, the birth of your dreams? Yeah. Oh, my God. It meant everything in the world. I mean, you know, I always knew I would breastfeed, um, but I didn't realize I'd breastfeed for three years. And it just meant absolutely everything to me. I mean, I, I can't even put it into words, the, you know, the emotion and the the special bond that you create with your child. I mean, it's not just nourishment that they get from that. It's, it's everything. It's, it's human connection. And they've even done studies on, you know, the, the eye contact between a mother and their baby while they're breastfeeding um, is actually the foundations for human connection when they're adults. I mean, that's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And then coupled with that, the fact that no matter how upset your child is, you know that you can comfort her by, you know, putting her to your chest. And there's so many other ways that there are to comfort children, but this is, it's an instant one. Your child can be hysterical crying and the minute they, they breastfeed, it's, it's just instant calm is resumed. So, um, yeah, and you know what, what I used to, I, I'm, I'm a scientist at heart and I used to love reading about the science of breastfeeding. And, and let's remember the science is still very, new on breastfeeding because there's, there's no no one has to gain financially from spending money researching breast milk but the fact that when your child is sick that the saliva from the child on the um aureole of the nipple will communicate to the body what to produce in what to put mm -hmm. into the breast milk to help that child get better i mean that's mind-blowing so is. um yeah i mean there's there's you know, the, the benefits are endless and it's just meant the entire world to me um, to breastfeed. And I had to go to I had to travel overseas last year for, for my business. And um, that was the end of my breastfeeding journey. And I remember that the, there's good and bad about that. The good thing is, is that I know exactly when my last feed was and I can remember it because we were sitting upstairs in, in Maya's bedroom on the little sofa in her room having a feed, just the two of us, before I went to get in the car and go to the airport. So I am able to cherish that memory. But would I have stopped breastfeeding had we had I not gone away? No, probably not. Um, but, you know, my supply was low, that that it, it just dried up when I was away. And, and she handled it perfectly fine. I explained to her <laughs> when I came back. Although she did ask if we could go to the fridge and get some milk and put it back into my boobies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's meant the entire world. And it's also meant that our paths have crossed, which I'll be eternally grateful for. Me too. De me oh, so much. Um, and I had the privilege of photographing you and Maya before you actually had gone away on this trip. So you have those photographs to look back on of you breastfeeding. So I'd like to, um, you know, some mothers may not think to take breastfeeding photographs they may not they, it may not be on their yeah. radar to yeah. have that aspect of motherhood photographed but what was it like for you to experience seeing those photographs of you Amaya? oh my 
goodness. Well, I mean, you first of all, the experience of having you, if you don't mind, I'll go, I'll go back to that. The, the experience of having you there, it was in the summer and um, you came and I remember it was a lovely day because we were both inside and outside and just um, it just felt like I was having a friend over for tea and that you were you were just you were there, but you were so, it, you know, subtle in your presence. And Maya and I were just, you know, behaving as we would normally behave, which I was really grateful for because I didn't know what would what it would be like because I'd never had this done before. And I was a little bit nervous, but you really put us both of us at ease instantly. And um, it just felt like yeah it just felt like we had a friend over and it was just lovely so and I remember Maya you know she opened up a little bit because she's quite quite shy and she opened up a little bit more towards the end and um it was it was just lovely it was just so lovely and you know we got dressed up and Maya was in a dress and it was a beautiful day and the whole experience was was so nice and it was like this familiarity that was there even though we hadn't met before so I was really grateful for that but then um, when it was your professionalism through the whole experience, which, which I was so I was so impressed by. And then we had the photo reveal, which I know you generally do in person, but obviously we had to do that um, under, in lockdown and, and online. And well, I mean, I, I can't even, I'll probably start crying if I talk about this, but you know, you, you, you uh, revealed this, video this video compilation that you had created along with this music and I just burst out crying and I was just speechless I mean absolutely speechless and it was I think for me as well because I'd stopped with because Maya had weaned and I had, was we were no longer breastfeeding it meant so much to me and I remember just thinking oh my goodness thank god I have I've, I had this done because these will be, and the, the difference between your photographs and anybody else's, if I may say, is that it's not just a moment that you're capturing, and it is, it is an incredible moment. It's the emotion and the atmosphere that it's attached to that picture. And I don't know how you do it because I've never seen pictures like it anywhere in my life. It's, you know, it's it's like a it's like you're getting you're inside you're inside the photo you're there with with those people sharing this incredibly intimate private moment which let's face it we all want to we're all completely voyeuristic at, at heart aren't we <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, are. we all want to climb inside that photo and be like ooh <laughs> yes um so I just think um I'm so lucky to be able to have had that done with you and they will be forever on on our walls and I just think what an amazing gift that would be to give to someone as well you know if somebody is looking for like a gift an unusual gift because we're all you know let's face it we're all looking for different ideas but be able to give the gift of your photography to someone um I think that's mine that would be absolutely mind-blowing to be able to to provide that for that and that it's a gift that you will have forever as well thank you so much for saying that and what what do you hope that maybe Maya gets from you having shared your story and and immortalizing it a bit through the photographs and through the written word that she will get to look back and reflect on throughout her life you know I hope she looks back on it and um sees me as a strong and determined person and you know the one thing I want to, her to grow up as is I want her to be independent of mind and strong and, and brave in with that one as well and I want her to see that you know despite despite everything I was told that I stuck to my guns and I, I knew what was best for her and I knew what was best for me and I persevered and I didn't listen to naysayers I, I trusted myself um, and I really hope that she will grow up with, with, with those characteristics. And I hope she'll look back and, and be proud of me for, for, for doing it, you know, and also grateful that I've, you know, I have the photos to show her um, of that story. I love that. And my hope, you know, just for anyone who might be wondering, I, I had an aunt who was featured in a book and the photograph, although the book was not about breastfeeding, was of her feeding my cousin Sarah back in 1986. And I grew up seeing that photograph and it just made my 
entrance into motherhood and my choice to breastfeed so much easier. So my hope is that this book will open up the conversations around breastfeeding. It will open up an understanding around breastfeeding, but hopefully the, the children that are featured in the book, if they go on to have children or if they have a partner who gives birth and wants to breastfeed, my hope is that they will find it so much easier to make that decision and so much easier yeah. to be supportive and that it will have normalized it for them because they will have been able to see it and understand yeah. it at a, in a different yeah. way than maybe some people that haven't been exposed to it. So I yeah. thank you so much for you and all of the other incredible individuals who have shared their stories because without you being open to sharing, without you being open to vulnerability and sharing your story and the honesty, this project would not exist. It wouldn't be able to make such a powerful impact. We wouldn't have this conversation opened up in the same way. So I will forever be so grateful to each of you for that and for just shining your own light through this book and through this project. And like we said earlier, like it's just caused our paths to cross, which is a blessing in itself, you know, regardless of all the other amazing things. Like, I'm so happy to know you and to know you know, other incredible women that have, that have chosen to share their story. Mm -hmm. It's just, I've said it before in another interview, but there's not one person being featured in the book that I wouldn't also want to know and be friends with and have yeah. a cup of tea with. And I know, you know how lucky are you? <laughs> how lucky are you to, you have, you've met, you've met all these incredible, incredible women, which is, is you're so lucky for, but also for you to bring, to highlight this, you know, there's lots of work done in Ireland to highlight the benefits of breastfeeding, but I think there's still a long way to go. So you were, and your work and your photographs and this book is going to be, you know, phenomenally important um, for the future of, of, of breastfeeding and women, um, you know, having the knowledge and the, the know-how. I think it's, it's so important. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to uh, bring the interview to a close now, but I really wanted to ask you before you go, um, what is the legacy that you hope to leave behind either through the work that you're doing or through being a parent to Maya? What are some things you would like to leave behind whenever you're no longer here? Oh my goodness. Um, I suppose my, my biggest wish is for Maya to grow up um, being an independent woman and to be a, a strong woman who knows her own mind and, and knows what she wants and um, to know that she can do anything that she sets her mind to. Um, and I love that phrase. You and I talked about this the other day. You know, she believed she could, so she did. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, that says it all for me and that she can be whatever she wants to be. And, and there's no, gonna be no set defined path. She will forge her way through life and, and do, but I want her to be passionate about what it is she does and passionate. And I also want her to just to be true to herself. Um, and if the diamond expert is the legacy I leave behind for her, then amazing and wonderful because she would be absolutely perfect at it, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, just to to be a strong and independent woman and hopefully to be proud of me uh, for what I've you know left behind for her. <laughs> you are such an incredible woman. So I have no doubt that she will be so proud of you and be so proud to have had you as her mother um, and to guide her along the way through through life. So um you, you've certainly have been a positive influence in my life and I would love for people to be able to get in touch with you. So if they want to reach out, what are the best ways for them to do that? So um, through either Instagram, uh, which is the Diamond Expert Ireland, uh, Facebook, which is the Diamond Expert Dublin. Um, and I can, you can link the, we can, I can send you the URLs or my phone number by WhatsApp directly. Um, and I also have a website which is going to be going live very soon. I'm going to, uh, I'll be sharing that on my Instagram account. Very good. Well, congratulations on all that you've achieved thus far. I'm so excited to see all that is to come. And I just thank, thank you, you for so sharing, <laughs> sharing your light, sharing who you are, sharing your beautiful words. I could listen to you all day long, um, but it's just <laughs> been such a pleasure. And I thank you. Thanks, Ariana, so much.